Boom. Miss Annie Jacobson. I read your book. Thank you for coming. Thanks I was sweating me. while I was reading it, but it is very informative. Appreciate you coming by. Thanks for having me, guys. We're very excited. Mm-hmm. So the first thing that caught me off guard was just how fast everything happens if everything goes through. You're saying six minutes, essentially, you have to make the decision for shooting retaliatory strikes. And then within, what, like 25, 30 minutes, the entire plan is just on fire. It's a very fast ticking clock. right? Yeah. So, you know, one of the first moments I had that's kind of like you're saying your moment was I was researching an earlier book and I was down in an archive in San Diego in their library down there. And there was a guy called Herb York, who is the first chief scientist at the Pentagon in the late 50s of DARPA. We were talking about that earlier. And in his papers, buried away, I found this detail that literally made my jaw drop and is important to this book. And that was the ICBM had just been invented. ICBM is the intercontinental ballistic missile that will take a warhead, a nuclear warhead from somewhere in, you know, the Soviet, then the Soviet Union, Russia, China, North Korea today, and drop it on Washington, D.C., or somewhere in America. And York, the scientist, wanted to know precisely how long it would take down to seconds. And so he hired the smartest men in the world at the time, the Jason scientists. If you have ever heard of them, like there's a zillion conspiracies about them. But the Jason scientists are real people. I've interviewed many of them. But he hired them to whittle down that number precisely. And the number they came up with was, do you want to guess? It's going to be like 20 minutes, right? Yeah, 26 minutes and 40 seconds. As of when? Like now or is this back then? This was then. So that was from a launch pad in the Soviet Union. And it hasn't changed Ballistic missile technology doesn't change, right? And so now North Korea is about 33 minutes. Mm. An engineer did the math for me. So you're talking about 30 minutes from launch to the end. And that's the first missile strike, the first nuclear warhead. And then what happens? And that's what nuclear war, a scenario, is all about. Wow. And so what made you want to touch on this? Because yeah. you've kind of gone into all yeah. sorts of different, you know, government secrets, Area 51, Pentagon, CIA, like why this book? So we were talking about that earlier. We were. And like, I mean, imagine being me writing six books about all, you know, interviewing hundreds of CIA officers, operators, Air Force pilots, spies, engineers, all these people in the national security umbrella over decades, as I have. And every single one of them always sort of caveating their role in all of this, in war, in weapons, by saying, oh, Annie, everything we do is to prevent Mm. nuclear World War III. And so the idea of this book is like, well, what happens if that fails, right? Because, and then you really get into it, and I, I bring up this concept in the book, which was shocking to me to really wrap my head around, even though I've heard of it, right? It's a concept called deterrence. If you guys, I mean, we're all athletes here, offense, defense, right? It's like the ultimate defense allegedly is deterrence. It's this idea, oh, I have a nuclear arsenal. So even if you have a nuclear arsenal and we're going to point them at one another, we're both obviously not going to use them because we'd both die if we did. This is mutually assured destruction, right? Yes, it is. Absolutely mad. And it's madness because it holds until it doesn't. Right. So next question, why did all these serious national security, top secret classified people talk to me about this book? Two Secretary of Defense's former, STRATCOM commander, former, right? Why did they talk to me? Well, because they're Cold War warriors, right? They're not of your generation. They're not even of my generation. They're of the cold, you know, they're elder statesmen now in their 80s. And they are all seriously concerned that that idea of deterrence is not a sacred concept to anyone in this world we now live in. 
from your experience interviewing these guys, because there was something that came out a few years ago in London that said there were more Russian spies in London <laughs> today than right. there were during the Cold War. Really? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. More yes. now? More now yes. than during the Cold War, when the Whoa. Iron Curtain was up. In your opinion, yeah. is this Cold War really over? What's up, boys? Check it out. Today's podcast is brought to you by Game Changer and something that has personally helped me on and off the field, the brain-boosting supplement, tri -Neuro. This is not your average nootropic. Let me break it down for you guys. tri -Neuro is here to tackle neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration head on. Basically, it's going to supercharge your brain. And if you've played football or any contact sport like I do, it will protect you in the long run. And even if you haven't, it's proven to improve things like memory, cognition, and creativity. And get this, price performance ratio is unmatched. It's like getting a Ferrari for the price of a scooter. Plus, it's not whipped up in some random dude's basement. Trineuro is the brainchild of world-renowned neurosurgeon, Dr. Javier Figueroa. Sourced and manufactured in the good old US of A, so you don't have to worry about some shady overseas mystery labs. Plus, it's on its way toward NSF certification, so that way you know there's no mystery ingredients. It's just some great American brain power. Now let's get back to the episode. I think, or does it just go on today with proxy wars fighting? I think you're absolutely right and well said because it was a cold war, meaning it wasn't a hot war. But, you know, again, it's that ticking cl time clock of it all, right? And, and these threats are just becoming more and more insidious. And, I mean, we're recording this before the book publishes, of but course. like... Right now, if you read the newspaper this morning, you've got multiple nuclear armed nations oh, yeah. that have that are under attack right now with what you would call proxy wars, small Correct. wars, right? The U.S. But yeah, Pakistan, being backed by bigger players, being in the backed by bigger players. But yeah. tick tock, tick tock. Where is that going? Where is that That's going? The reason I wrote this book was not to terrify everyone no, to scare people. S you know stop but rather to terrify people truly and make them realize oh my god like nuclear the use of nuclear weapons is total madness the most important concept in this book is that you see i show and by the way it's not just me showing it's my sources relaying to me that if nuclear war begins, it will not stop. It will not stop until the total annihilation of civilization. And also, all of this happens, as I write in the book, in minutes and hours, not even days. Wow. This is going to sound like an off-the-wall question, but I think um, <laughs> for like laymen like us, anytime you look in the face of your own mortality like that, as a species, your next question is... Um, a, is there a purpose for our being here? Right. And B, is there something that is looking out for all of the people who are inevitably going to suffer? So my question to you, which is a wild question, but I think it is pertinent, is do you believe in God or a higher power mm -hmm. of some kind? I think that's the best question that one can ask. And I think that that is the only question that you can ask if you actually want to be hopeful and believe that progress can be made on these things. Otherwise, you're just stuck with like the darkness and the cynicism and, you know, the disaster of it all. And interestingly, I end the book very much on the note that you raise, right? Not with sort of God or a higher power per se, because, you know, my, my sort of how I feel philosophically or spiritually I try to leave out of my books because otherwise you, you go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Oh, the author thinks this or that, right? Um, but I reference a very incredibly spiritual site in southern Turkey called Gobekli Tepe, which is an archaeological site that was found in the 1990s by a German archaeologist named Klaus Schmidt. And no one knew it was there. Like, no one knew it was there. And it's 12,000 years old. It's been buried for 12,000 years. And, like, Google it. I I've mean, heard Graham Hancock talking about, talking about yes. it. With the younger Dryas impact and all that. And, and, got wiped and out. separate from theories of why it's there, yeah. 
it's there. And what I found remarkable to your question about like who we are as a species, right? That like how scientists for at least my whole life have always, you know, you, when I was a kid in school, it was like, oh, you know, man became civilized because what we're talking about here in this book is the destruction of civilization, the end of civilization, right? So I was taught, oh, civilization began when man became hunter-gatherers, like around, let's say, 9,000 years, BC, 9,000 BC, okay? And everybody adhered to that idea. And then this site gets found, and that timeline gets pushed back, not just 3,000 years, but pre-hunter-gatherer, because hunter-gatherers did not exist at Gobekli Tepe carved into the into the stones are all these wild animals meaning not domesticated animals you know cranes and albatrosses and you know vultures right foxes and so to your idea like it made me think whoa this is so intense like man because to build gobekli tap involved architects it involved mm. early architects. It involved groups of people working together. We talked about this earlier. We're all athletes, team players, right? So civilization grew out of being a team before, you know, domestication of animals, before society. So it suggests that is how society, how civilization happened, which is a long-winded version of the hopeful answer is, is yes. I believe that you have to look toward bigger ideas to find a solution, to believe in a solution, to believe that, you know, we're all not headed to hell in a handbasket because of how many wars are killing so many people relentlessly and have ever since the end of World War II. Right. With the amount of different scientists and, you know, diplomats and whoever that you talk to and people like us, you know, who are, we're just, you know, regular. regular is it is it interesting to you, like, just the differences in, like, the human brain for the same people, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, and the way they think about the world and these people who are developing these complex, you know, uh, nuclear weapons that I can't mm -hmm. even imagine, you know, I don't even... I struggle with, uh, you know, an atom sometimes, you know, so <laughs> the thing about that stuff, I watch Oppenheimer and I, you know, mm -hmm. I think I really did something that right, day, maybe. you know? Yes, you um, did. Go on. Yeah. But, it, yeah. but is that just interesting to interview these people and, and see how differently everyone's brain yeah. works? Well, such a great thing to think about because I agree with you wholeheartedly that like, I mean, I am not a science brain, right? And I interview the smartest scientists in the world. You know, and I've been made fun of for not being like scientifically brilliant. Oh, well. Right. Um, far more interesting to me is that my brain works narratively and I my brain works like a storyteller. And I believe that one of my greatest strengths in being a reporter is being completely honest with these you know, brilliant people I interviewed, Nobel laureates, like, I don't understand how, you know, right? Just like you, because that's the transparent truth of it. And ultimately, what I learn out of that is that we are all so much more alike than different, right? Like, just because you have a science brain doesn't mean you don't change the diapers on your kids. And I mean that literally. Right. So I'll give you an example. One of my favorite mentors, and, and he existed in several of my books, was a guy called Ed Lovick Jr. And he's also known as the grandfather of stealth. He's in my Area 51 book because he developed stealth technology for the CIA starting when Eisenhower was president. OK. Mm -hmm. And he's passed now. But I interviewed him when he was in his 80s and 90s, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And he was telling me. Uh, so he worked for Lockheed, you know, Lockheed, the yeah, defense yeah, contractor, yeah. right? And they have Skunk Works, which is like it's uber secret, you know, in this day and age, like Lockheed Skunk Works. Well, Lovick was there on the ground floor working directly with Kelly Johnson, the founder of Lockheed Skunk Works early days to develop these, this intense technology. And they were trying to develop stealth so we could overfly Russia. Again, everything ties back to nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. Why? It's the 50s and we needed to know what are their, how much technology do they have? Do they have tanks lined up on the field? Do they have, mm. what are their subs like? All of this stuff, right? 
So we invented the U-2 spy plane to fly high enough over Russia that they couldn't shoot it down. Lovick was in charge of that, right? The U-2 was like pre-stealth. But he and then they knew the the CIA knew the U two was going to get shot down, which it did. So they Gary were inventing yeah. yes. So they were inventing the what we know of as the SR seventy one, but the precursor to that was called the A twelve ox cart, right? So, anyways, long winded thing, Lovick, brilliant, brilliant mind. Guess how he invented? Guess how he solved the mystery of stealth. By accident somehow. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, so they tried everything, you know, deflection, reflection. They're doing all these things, and it's like they've literally got President Eisenhower like, where's the secret, right? And one day he was came home from Lockheed Skunk Works, and his wife was like, time to fucking change the diapers, you know, pull your weight. And he was changing his child's diapers. The child peed. And he watched the urine go into the diaper and he had his eureka moment because he figured out the secret to stealth technology is absorption. Okay? Literally, that is physics. It is just basic observation. So here they had been trying to ref learn, they were trying to reflect radar, you know, off of the objects, right? So that it was, so that it's not visible to the, to the ground radar. But in fact, it was a combination of reflection and absorption. So they created this radar absorbing coding for the aircraft that allowed stealth to work for the first time. I mean, it got incredibly refined over the decades, but that's the fundamental. And so when you get a guy like Ed Lovick telling you it's just observation, it takes a lot of the power out of, you know, oh, I don't think like Oppenheimer. It's like, no, you don't. No, I don't. But... All our thoughts are all interestingly moving, can be interestingly moving in the right directions for us individually. Wow. These technologies are insane that DARPA is coming up with. And I heard you talk a little bit about it in, I think, the Pentagon's brain, right? Mm -hmm. Was that the one? Yeah. Like how, like I understand the military industrial complex, right? It kind of revolves around nuclear war. You were talking, mm -hmm. um, well, it started with Eisenhower after Stalin and them launched Sputnik. And so, like, mm -hmm. we, we always need to be ahead. Um, then, obviously, the Germans were incredibly advanced in World War II. But, like, how do you grapple with the idea of we do need to be ahead, but also right. it's causing lots of suffering, all these wars, because that, in turn, is how they get funding, right? So That's the chicken or the egg yeah. conundrum that lies at the heart of all of this. And I don't know the answer. You know, the guys at the Pentagon call it the self-licking ice cream cone scenario, right? Like, it's like it's just taking care of itself. And we see that. And now what's interesting to me is we read about it in, in newspapers. This used to be sort of above most people's interest of thinking. Well, not not really. But, you know, I feel like more and more it's becoming a, a, a concept that people really want to think about, like, what is the point of said war, war X, war Y, war Z, other than, you know, defense contractors building new weapon systems, yeah. right? I talked to a guy in the intelligence community the other day who told me that um, Raytheon, I believe it is, isn't even doing its marketing department anymore. It has orders that it cannot fill. What do you mean? Oh, from... They don't need to market. They don't need to be like, hey, mm -hmm. buy our weapons. Right. Because they're so far <clears throat> advanced, you're saying? No, they no, just have... so much demand for their weapons. The back orders for... The, it's just like we have... Enough, we, we need to fill these orders before yeah. we can worry about yeah. trying to find new clients. Yeah. There's war in Europe, war in the Middle East. Yeah. There's so much going on, right? Wow. And like, how about all these like... These systems that we don't even consider because we're talking about like with biology, what they were doing mm -hmm. with moths and rats and um, was it remote viewing? Like mm -hmm. all these technologies on the cutting edge that we're not even considering. Like what are, what are things that you're hearing that we're doing? Well, there's the, you know, the nuclear war book to me is the ultimate sort of zeroing out of all of this because yeah. 
it's in it, it and it feeds and fosters a lot of these other technologies, right? So the idea is, oh, we have mutual assured destruction, so no one's going to use their giant weapon systems, right? Which is, I mean, the nuclear triad, and we should talk about it because because it's just shocking. Right? But and so you have that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you have the smaller weapons and weapon systems which will fight proxy wars, right? Which which take you know endless amounts of taxpayer monies. But the nuclear defense system, for example, the new budget came out and it's for the next decade, it's, you know, $760 billion. This is just for upkeep. We're not technically creating new nuclear weapons. Mm. This is like sort of for updating, right? So you think about the massive size of that. I mean, do, do you guys know about the nuclear triad? North Korea, China, Russia. No, not not the tri not the not the the triad. Of, not like the enemies versus the, you know, the offense defense. But geographically, what a, no? What our weapon systems are right? No, okay. No. All right. Can I give you like the please, please. okay? So oh, please. At, we have. Well, let me ask you this. Uh -huh. Right here's the guessing game part of it. Okay, we have a system. We have. I told you the the I, this idea of deterrence is predicated on. My weapons are pointed at you and yours are pointed at me. So no one shoot. Don't, you know, right? It's not like, oh, I have my gun in my, you know, back house locked in a safe. Yeah. It's like right here, okay? Um, so one nuclear weapon, one one megaton nuclear weapon can kill a million, millions of people launched on a city, as I demonstrate in the book. So how many of those do you think we have on ready for launch status, ready to go, right here on my hip. Don't you dare think about it. Well, I read it in the book, yeah. but okay. I, I don't okay. know if these guys want to guess. Okay, several hundred. I know okay, the what do you Russians think? have like over a thousand, right? Okay, what do you, several hundred we got. Mo knows the answer because he read the book. Yeah, I, I would say somewhere from 75 to over 100. Okay. Oh, jeez. It's way more. It, than it's that, around right? what, 1,500, 1,600? 1,770. Yeah. 1, That's yeah. just the US. That's just the US. Russia has 1,680 yeah. something. Okay? And that's so, nukes right. and underground ones. Those, yes, that, that's I the mean, nuclear. I uh, mean, submarine and underground. That's yeah. the arsenal. That's like, so you have a nuclear warhead. The warhead, you know, people think nuclear bomb. Well, there's a warhead. And then there's the delivery system. And so that's what the triad is. The triad, we have a triad, three systems. We have uh, we have ICBMs that are in silos underground. We've got, and we have 400 of them ready to go. They take 60 seconds to launch. That's from pressing the red button to they're out the ground, they're in the air. And it's not a red button. It's the president giving a two-word command. The president... And only the president reads the two-word command to someone standing in the underground bunker beneath the Pentagon. It's called the National Military Command Center. And can he alone make that decision? The president? Just him. Yeah. Just him. He could the the so he's in the room. He says, yeah, I think we should launch. Everyone goes, no, that's a bad idea. Let's not launch. And this is the central, most shocking and yet most basic non-negotiable question. The president of the United States has sole launch authority. Soul launch authority. He doesn't ask anyone. He doesn't ask the Joint Chiefs of the Chairman of That's the Joint Chiefs, Chiefs of Staff. He doesn't ask the Secretary of Defense. He alone decides to launch nuclear weapons. So, what if you end up with a president who's a big pacifist? Someone fires at you. He says, "Well, I'm not firing back. I'll kill millions of people." That then is a great point. And what if you wind up with that? That is it. And what if you wind up with a president who's trigger a madman? Yeah, trigger happy. King. Yeah, trigger happy. Who doesn't understand? That that one weapon is backed up by one that thousand. Because by the way, in interviewing two secretaries of defense, as they confirmed with me, most presidents do not pay attention during their briefing on nuclear weapons, <laughs> right? L straight out of the mouth of two secretaries of defense, is this is not Annie Jacobson's no, no. idea about things. This is out of the mouth of those who know. Why why aren't they paying attention? Is it just someone else? They think it's not likely. Yeah, it's not because happen. it's not going to happen, right? Deterrence will hold. <coughs> okay. What became of the initiatives, such as the Star Wars initiative, right under Reagan, to say, have 
your own nuclear arsenal but have the capacity to stop anyone else from hitting you. It is total fantasy, right? Okay, so let me back, before I get, that's called the Interceptor Program, right? So before Mm -hmm. I tell you about that, let me tell you, you, we got our 400 silos, ICBMs, they launch in one minute. That's why they're called Minutemen, even though they're really called Minutemen because of the Revolutionary War, but that's the double entendre. 60 seconds, okay? Silo doors open, and an ICBM cannot be recalled. That's it. Not ours, not theirs. Okay. Then we have 14 nuclear ballistic armed submarines. 14. They're called Ohio class. Okay. Those carry Trident missiles with multiple warheads on each. Okay. They take about 14 minutes to launch from receiving the order. Okay. And then we have our bombers. We have our B-52s, which are those big giant things you've seen fly, you know, since World War II or right after. And then you have the B-2s, the stealth bombers. And we have 66 of those. And together they carry all those weapons, the 1,770, which isn't to mention those that are in, in, you know, in back, literally in the back house under the, oh, just been sitting right? There for a there's, a, there's about 5,000, okay? And that's the same with Russia. And that doesn't include China, and that doesn't include North Korea. This is just the two superpowers, okay? This is why it's insane. Because you could have the trigger-happy president who's like, screw them, I'm launching a nuke. And no one stops him, by the way. No one can. No, and if you watch on YouTube, if you're interested in this now, you, which is how one of the major impetuses for me writing the book was like, during COVID, um, there were a lot of congressional hearings with the STRATCOM commander. So the STRATCOM commander is the that's strategic command. And mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the commander who receives the order from the president. President doesn't tell SECDEF what to do. President doesn't tell Joint Chiefs of Staff what to do. President talks to the National Military Command Center under the Pentagon. They give the order to STRATCOM. Boom. Okay. And the STRATCOM commanders were concerned about then POTUS, Mr. Trump, with this sort of madman idea because of some of the fire and fury language around the North mm-hmm. Korean dictator. And so it was brought to the attention of the American public in a, in a manner that this reporter was like, wow, this is really transparent. Like they were actually talking about this in open session in Congress that yes, the president had sole authority. What are the two words? <laughs> oh, well, no, 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 that's okay, because they are like Tango Alpha. Yeah, you know what I mean? Change, They're right? just like Zulu. You, you, can almost, you can almost sleep talk them, you know, yeah, by, yeah. by and, accident. And, no, but by the way, they're, they're not set in stone. They are inside. Okay, so one of the interesting things for this book was, you know, Los Alamos Laboratory yeah, yeah. was very helpful to me. It. And they actually declassified for the book the story of the football. You know how the president carries the football? Yeah. Well... You can read in the book the actual, that was not known how it came to be. And I describe it in the book, but the football has inside of it the this book of options, right? So it's not just as simple as launch. It's like, wait, who's firing at us? If nuclear war were to happen, if that six minute window that Mo talked about, right? If we learn that someone is launching at us, we have a policy called launch on warning. It's not called launch on they hit us with a nuclear weapon no. it's called launch on warning because we have satellite systems in space that allow for the united states to see a nuclear launch guessing game again guess how long it takes us to see the missile fires how long until the president guess how long it? until our satellite systems see it see it so over in north korea two i begin minutes. The, two minutes okay what do you say Seconds, thirty seconds. No way. Okay, it won't ready? Even be in the atmosphere. Bella, it's immediately a fraction, like a second, yeah, a less, fraction, than, less a second. than one second. You could see the how the, could you the plumes from underneath? How could you be sure? Look at this man, his future president, right here. <laughs> there we go. Right? How could you be sure that it was a nuclear warhead that was sat atop the ICBM that's being launched? Our satellite system, it's called Sibers, right? Space-based infrared satellite system Uh, so we've been working on these technologies since the launch of sputnik in 1957 it's so 
advanced, its sensor systems in space can see the hot rocket exhaust on the ICBM launch. And they know instantly, this is computers, this is machine learning. People call it AI. It's machine mm -hmm. learning, right? And they, it can measure the, 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 the plume of the rocket exhaust in a fraction of a second and notify and begin notifying the trajectory, right? Oh, so yeah. a satellite launch, and this is a, is straight up. So like the Sibir system knows within a few seconds, this is going into space, but this is not. Is not. And then, and this is the, this is the ticking clock counting down scenario here. That's so frightening when I learned it and hopefully frightening to readers, right? Yeah. You start, because it's all based in fact, like, oh, five seconds, they know, and I have maps drawn, right? In five seconds, Sibbers knows it's heading, it's not going to Hawaii, right? it's, going here, it's yeah. all the breakdown of it. But and because you said they have fire on warning, how long would it take from the notification that you're being fired upon to now we're already firing back? Okay, so, what has to happen is secondary confirmation. This is U.S. policy, okay? So the missile that tw we talked about, 26 minutes, 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. Three stages. Boost phase, that's when the missile's like firing up. Mid-course phase, it's moving across the globe. And then terminal phase. That's like Coming the end. Yeah, okay. that, that, that doesn't need an explanation, right? Boost phase only lasts a couple of minutes. And so that's the only time Sibbers can see. And then begins the process of now we're going to have to shoot that fucker down. Pardon my French. No, but that's what it is, mm -hmm. right? And so this is why we have all these other systems around the world. And I talk about it. It's called over the horizon radar. We have a system in Alaska that will then see and confirm and give that secondary confirmation. Mm -hmm. And once that secondary confirmation happens, that's when the president is notified, like very specifically, you know, or let's say around eight minutes, the president is notified. And now he has six minutes to make his decision. What's he going to do? To launch. And we have a launch on warning policy. And as I write in the book, launch on warning, okay, the president could say, you know what, let's hold and absorb, it's called absorb the attack. Yeah. Right. And then we'll go from there. And we'll see what happens. But you and, can't, right? Well, he could because the president can do whatever he wants. Well, technically you can, but then all of our facilities are compromised. Well, not right. necessarily. Yeah, because <laughs> you've got all the submarines, the Trident system, the UK has a yeah, Trident system. Yeah, but who's going to order the, the weapons to, to launch? Well, well, here's my question. Yeah, you've got a good point. <laughs> Presumably the president knows. Let's say he looks on his desk as like 15 nukes headed his way. Mm -hmm. He has to be alive in order to give the order. And if he's firing back and he's like, yeah, let's shoot like 50 of them. There has to be some plan in place, presumably, to get the president to out. continue being alive whilst being hit by X amount. And of I get into weapons. that. That's called continuity of government, baby. right? Here's what I'm, you guys were. You guys are gonna all have to read the book once no, it publishes, and we're coming back and having. A, I can't we're going. Wait. Okay. We're going on the mats about what you know. We right because I have a question too about something I yeah. read in there. So you were talking about like our <clears throat> our system in the satellite where we can detect yeah. when it goes up. <clears throat> the Russian equivalent, Tundra as you said, is allegedly very faulty. And there's been declassified documents where they saw clouds moving around uh, and they thought a ton were going into them. And so it was a matter of seconds they were going to yeah. launch some at us. That scared the shit out of yeah. me. Yeah. And it should scare the shit out of you. And it scared the shit out of me. I mean, reporting this book was a process of having the shit scared out yeah, of me. This is real. Again and again and again. Because, you know, learning... Okay, the Russians have a comparable system, or rather they say they have a comparable system. They don't have the brains and the technology no. that we do. A lot of these countries steal our technology, right? They steal our IP. That's why North Korea can has a missile that can get to the United States because they stole rocket technology from the Russians or they bought it, we don't know, but we know it's their rocket technology. And why do we know? Because we have satellite images and really smart people that I interview for the book, you know, examine this stuff and tell us that. But yet, but you're absolutely right, Mo, that they, the Tundra system this misidentifies sunlight for missile launch. It, it, as the missile moves through the cloud cover, it confuses the number of warheads. And so you could have an 
absolute errant launch by the Russians because they think weapons are coming for them that might not. The other thing that didn't make sense is we only have 44 interceptors. If we're under attack, it's going to be hundreds of missiles. That that made no sense to me. I mean, the, there's no way the, of stopping it. Exa- and this was your question about SDI, right? This, so I and and by the way, you know, to your point about like people that are like really smart and you think I don't know that and uh, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. I remember being at a dinner party with someone who had been a congressional staffer, right? Like like that person should be in the know, right? And I said to them, they will remain nameless. Oh, I'm writing this book about nuclear war. Da, 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 and I expl- you know, we had this concept about, and they turned to me very sort of self-righteously and said, oh, Annie, you know, our interceptor system will shoot all that down. <laughs> and I just went like, <laughs> no, no shot. Like I was just politely didn't say anything and was like, mm, note to self, like definitely really drill down on that reporting. And it's, absolutely for certain not questionable that we have 44 interceptor missiles in the book i demonstrate like they're 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 have sort of like a 55 percent kill rate right so that's not even great like 22 okay but how many weapons are coming at us over 1600 so what is the point of that you know my question it's all for show what would mm. be the point of firing 1,600 nukes at anybody? Because, because presumably you, don't you only just want to take down the one, government, right? right? So you could take out the whole country? You gonna... own, you own, well, that's a technology, believe it or not. It's not a technology. It's nomenclature called use them or lose them. Mm. Okay? Use them or lose them strategy. We don't fire them all. We're not, we're like, what's the point in even having them? Because okay, they're going to fire at us. And remember, you only have 26 minutes and 40 seconds or 33 yeah, minutes. And the world's and, over. By the way, with a sub... And some engineers walked me through this. You know, a sub can hit Los Angeles, a a warhead launched from a sub, or New York in under 10 minutes. Under 10 minutes. And, you know, this used to be so classified and sort of like a tightly held secret, but it's not anymore. And I'll tell you a document I found. I reprinted in the book. In, I think it was 2021, fiscal year 2021, the Defense Department appealed to Congress for more money for these systems. And in doing so, it showed a map of where China's subs and Russia's subs, you know, survey America mm-hmm. from, how close they can get. It's Whoa. in a couple hundred miles of New York City. So we know where their subs are. We know. we Well, we can track the trails sort of. We have a very complex system so, called SOSIS, but we can't do it in real time. Right. Mm. So it's sort of like where they've been. We can see where they've been. And that's so we know the capability is there for both Russia and China. And arguably now a lot of people will tell you North Korea could never get a sub anywhere near America. But others and I and I argue why in the book, you know, all it takes is one sub. But Russia, I mean, uh, North Korea has a fleet of allegedly more than 80 submarines. You know, some of these numbers are just absolutely shocking when you really drill into them. And they just don't, they're not known about in the general public because, no. like, w- you know, people are more interested in talking about aliens and bio weapons and things like that than they are about the fact that, you know, listen, here's the bottom line nuclear war between a nuclear exchange between America and Russia will likely kill 5 billion people and end civilization. And what of the other 3 billion? Nuclear winter is a very grim, grim situation, and it's how I report the end of the book. And by the way, nuclear winter was developed in in around 1983 by five scientists, including Carl Sagan. One of the scientists is still alive and teaching, and his name is Professor Brian Toon, and I interview him for the Mm. book. And he's still at it with, like, climate models that are now, you know, climate modeling computer systems that are so advanced that they weren't in the 80s, and they show us... The Defense Department at the time sort of papawed nuclear winter, like, that's an exaggeration. No, never. That's Soviet propaganda. Well, actually, no. It's right on right on the money. What if you're in Australia or New Zealand, like we were talking about before? Are those, yeah. 
Like, is there any area on the planet where it's, hey, civilization might continue you gotta be in the southern as hemisphere, close right? to the as normal. it was yeah. before? So Professor Toon and his team mapped out exactly this question and the places that might still be able to have agriculture, because that's what it boils down to, yeah. because Radiation. nuclear winter blocks out the sun, mm. right? So around the planet, it goes down approximately 40 degrees Fahrenheit. On so average? Regardless of on where average. you are. Well, except for the, the okay. tiny bottom, right? So places like Iowa are sub-freezing sub temperatures for four or five or six years, never changing. So how that, there goes agriculture, yeah, right? That. And so New Zealand, Australia, and like some places in Argentina, there could still be agriculture there. So that's who gets to live. Would right. you even want to be alive? Isn't yeah, there the like the, the, wouldn't the living be envious of the dead? Is that's the Stalin quote, right? That's right. the Khrushchev quote. Or yeah. Khrushchev, yeah. yeah, the survivors would envy the dead. I want to know, in your opinion, how likely a scenario mm -hmm. like that is in playing out. What's crazy is it's like either a hundred percent not or a hundred percent yes. Yeah. There's no <laughs> middle yeah, there's ground. No in between, yeah. That is what is bananas. It and so who. Why is anyone even remotely willing to take this risk? And the interesting thing is also there's so many people who have been dedicated to disarmament. That's what it's called when you're like, yep. okay, we got to get rid of nuclear weapons or the concept of nuclear war. And how do you get rid of the concept of nuclear war unless you get rid of the nuclear weapons, right? Yeah. There are so many people who have been dedicated to this subject for decades. And they just exist in a very small, almost echo chamber is how one person described it to me. Like they all know. And the rest of us are like whistling by the graveyard. Then it comes down to trust, right? Because if I, as a nation, totally disarm, then I have to have full trust that You're gonna do the a same. foreign nation does the same, even if they have one or two. Technically, they can take over your country and the entire planet, right? And I forget, there's as some long countries. as they have and you don't. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole theory. There's right? some countries yeah. that are also and trying to get into nuclear weaponry. Right. They're no, no, not currently in it, but I don't think to... that trust will ever exist. No. Yeah. And so it's either zero right. or just full exactly. scale arms race. There's nothing in between. How do they test these enormous nuclear bombs? Can you ever mm -hmm. test them? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, one of the most interesting elements of this in my personal brain is that I interviewed for three years the man who pulled the trigger on 186 atmospheric nuclear weapons while we still did testing in the 50s and 60s. In the atmosphere? In this the was atmosphere. Starfish Prime? We what? This was Starfish Prime? Well, Starfish Prime was a good, good call there. Starfish Prime was up in space, and that was a very important nuclear weapons test because we learned about EMP. Of course. But atmos there were atmospheric bombs. We had a test site in Nevada, believe it or not, the Nevada test site, where we set off 102 some odd nuclear weapons, mushroom cloud and all in the 1950s. There are photographs of them in my book and, el and you know elsewhere. And then in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific is where we set off the megaton thermonuclears. And the fellow in my, that I write about in Area 51 um, that they call the trigger man, Al O'Donnell, um, together with another colleague, Jim Friedman, they Friedman photographed them, and uh, O'Donnell was part of the arming party. That's what it was called, and they wired the actual nuclear weapons, and they and he would take me to the museum in Las Vegas, uh, at the Nevada, you know, um, test site affiliate, and we would look at these photographs of these nuclear bombs, and he would say you know, oh my God, we live in fear of the day where none of us who saw the power, the monstrous power of these megatons, they watched them from 50 miles away, right? And they could, and like the heat, and they had to have, you know, they have the dark welder's glasses on and they could see the monstrous destruction. And he said, we live in fear of the day when no one is alive who saw this because then it becomes just a, 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 a psychological conceit, yeah. right? The theory in UFO lore is that when all these tests were going on, that's when the sightings and the crashes mm -hmm. were happening with the aliens. What's your take on all mm -hmm. of that? Oh, like Roswell? 
Mm -hmm. It was like mid 40s, 50s is kind of when like everything starts ticking up and there's all these sightings above the nuclear testing sites and Air Force individuals Mm -hmm. are are talking about this. Do you think there's that's coincidence or like what do you think about it? I think people build narratives, right? And I kind of, I love reading Carl Jung, the um, psychologist about this because he believed that this whole idea of UFOs um, and aliens was a representation of like the dark shadow side of man who had, you know, to your question earlier, like just created something that could bring about his own extinction. Right. You know, and then you have Einstein saying um, when he was asked, you know, what weapons will World War Four be fought with? And sticks he, and stones, he right. said sticks and stones. Right. So that is a, you know, the invention of the atomic bomb. Um, and of course, the atomic bomb is tiny compared to what the thermonuclear the bomb. Is. Right. Um that was a dividing line in man, you know, in man's sort of existence because suddenly it's not just that we could end the world, it's that we could end the world in seconds and minutes. It's why I wrote Nuclear War, a scenario, because you see like this ticking clock is literally a ticking clock. It's a ticking clock in the narrative, but it's a ticking clock in reality because um, as I as I write, like, Man creates systems of systems, right? There, you know, we ourselves are a system of systems. We're like a complex organism, right? But the man-made ones always fail. Mm. They're made, and I suppose you could say the human ones yeah. do too. We all die. But the man-made ones always fail. The Defense Department is a system of system. Nuclear weapons are a system of systems. They fail. Dot, dot, dot. Hello. Can you touch on a little bit what you write in Area 51 with Stalin's program mm-hmm. in terms of like the Roswell crash and all that? Because mm-hmm. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's the war of the world's narrative, right? Okay. Um, which interestingly, because I wrote like a very scary narrative that if we if it was 1938 and we were all listening to radios and I was doing the radio reading, someone could go, oh, my God, the world is not right. But we know better now and we have a lot of information and things travel fast. And we know this is a scenario, a fact based scenario. Right. But when the war of the worlds was read on the radio, people freaked out and thought the world was ending. OK. And as classified documents show The Defense Department wasn't the Defense Department then, the War Department, you know, became aware of all of this. People were like, oh, this is a narrative, you know, potential propaganda hoax, okay? What we also know now, and I write about this in Area 51, is on the opposite side of the world, Stalin, too, was obsessed with the War of the Worlds. He was obsessed with the power of narrative, how you could make people think something was happening that wasn't really happening, right? And we all kind of like today, we're like, yeah, that's pretty true. But like this was, think about 1930, think about like the world in 38 and then during World War II, I mean, analog systems, it was like narrative messaging was powerful. And at the time when early warning radar, okay, the the way in which you could use technology to be like, oh, my God, there's a plane coming, which didn't exist before. It used to be spotters, like Mm. on a hill. I see something, you know, then suddenly you had technology that could do that. And this idea emerged that what if, on the Russian side of things, again, we know this from classified documents, what if we could overwhelm the Americans early warning radar systems, okay, then we could attack them. And that was where Stalin's idea of the war of the world hoax became like super interesting to him from these documents. And that is where this idea that I write about in Area 51 came that the Roswell scenario was in fact a Russian hoax on the United States. 
a test to see how would Americans react to a UFO crash on their soil. We're still talking about it today. And here we are talking about it today, obsessively, right? And I have very strong reasons to believe that narrative based on people I have interviewed that I trust and worked with for a long time. Not everyone follows that line of thinking. Many people I know absolutely believe in aliens and in UFOs. Many very smart scientists with PhDs who are astrophysicists, you know, and so I differ with them in opinion. And I think the difference of opinion makes for really interesting dialogue, thought, concepts, right? Because it's the this that we're all, you know, really shit out of luck. If that's if that's just the way, if, if things continue in the manner of polemic aggression towards one another, both mm-hmm. internally in America and externally around the world, you, you know, nuclear war, a scenario becomes not nuclear war, a scenario, but nuclear war. Reality. Okay. And how did he make this program seem like an alien crash? I get into that in, in my book, Area yeah. 51, which you can read and which when we, we come read, back yeah. at time, right? Yeah. The thing that seems mm-hmm. to be weaving all of your books together, now I'm seeing the bigger picture, is the use of technology mm-hmm. in many different ways. Mm -hmm. and in many ways aggressive. I want to know for you, because you've done so much research on this, what is the most frightening technology that you think there is that you've come across in these years of research and the amalgam of information you've picked up? Is it simply the nuclear weapon? Is it the warhead? And this is what scares you at night, or is it something else that we haven't really touched upon? No, it's a great... I mean, it's really, interestingly, it's not the technology, it's the intent, right? It's always the human. I mean, technology has always existed and it's the dual use idea. It's your friend or it's not, you know? Um, I mean, I did an interview, one of my favorite interviews with one of the smartest people in the whole world, a guy called Charles Towns, and he won the Nobel Prize in the 60s, right? So I interviewed him when he was not, he was like either 98 or 99, okay? It was his last interview. He was sharp as a whistle. He was still keeping office hours at Berkeley, Okay. Oh, wow. And he invented the laser, right? He talked to me about running the idea by Einstein. Okay. That's right. Crazy. They were at Princeton together. Right. Yeah. And uh, he was just such a remarkable person. But what he told me was re- that was very interesting was, and it, I've thought about it ever since, is the concept you're touching upon, which is dual use, right? So the laser. I mean, laser eye surgery. My laser printer. Yep. The laser is like this incredible concept for all of us. But if you try to talk to the generals at the Pentagon about laser weapons, you will get a, I can't answer that, Annie, it's classified. Because laser weapons are a massive new component of the military industrial complex. Mm. So much money going into that, that you can't even, and and that it will take weaponry to a totally new system, okay? So that's the new thing, what do they do with lasers? You know, shoot things down. Yeah, yeah, I mean, lasers were the foundation of SDI, which you referred yep. to. They're just, you know, laser, think of how fast light moves, right? So think yeah. about being able to cut that 33 minutes mm-hmm. down into a fraction of yeah, a second, zero. right? That's what laser technology, that's what laser weapons are. And that's where that's going. But again, use, right? But, you know, to your question, because I love the idea of human beings and I love, oh, I mean, that's it sounds so silly, <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's, I like them too. It, right? They're decent <laughs> right? sometimes. Yeah. But like, I love the I love the idea of human beings' frailty, mm. and human beings' secret keeping, right? Because secret keeping is a component of vulnerability and of frailty. And Charles Towns told me something that was so amazing, and he didn't tell me for the first time. He had been writing about this for I think about ten years before he died, right? But he kept it secret for a long time. And that is that he believes that he was given the answer to laser technology from above. He called him God. Charles Towns tells the story, and you can Google this. He wrote a paper for Harvard about this later in life, that he was sitting on a park bench and he got the idea, that idea that he ran by Einstein that he couldn't quite figure out. He got the idea from God on a park bench, okay? God in air quotes, right? I don't, 
you know, and what is remarkable about this is towns didn't want to talk about this because in the 50s and 60s, you could not have faith. You could not believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. That was sacrilege. Mm. And so I love the fact that in his late in life, he, he made this revelation about himself because it was important to him as a human, right? Not because he believed in God and someone else might not, but rather that that was his deep, sacred, personal feeling. And he didn't, he felt like he need, he wanted to keep it to himself. And there's a lot to be learned on two things there. One, like pursue your faith if that is interesting to you. But the other thing is like, you don't have to tell everybody about it. You don't have to report everything on Instagram, right? And I think that that idea of developing your own sacred tenets inside of yourself is a message that Towns was really trying to convey in later life and is super important. To your point about uh, Stalin's War of the Worlds and the intersection of nuclear weapons and uh, counterintelligence yeah. or aliens, I may have a solution that is either the dumbest thing I've ever come up with or the <laughs> smartest. Okay, let's hear okay, it. Here's what we do. We go to Putin, Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un. We say, look, we got aliens out there that have stronger nuclear weapons than us. They can get there. Ours are 20. These are a fraction mm -hmm. of the second. We're gone. Okay. The thing is, the aliens aren't real. It's the narrative. Mm. It's the narrative. But we need to create a strong enough narrative right. to now, now right. we're on the same team looking against up the aliens. against the aliens who aren't real and can't shoot at us, mm -hmm. but we have to make it real Let's enough. Go, cool. I don't know how we mm -hmm. do that. That's the problem. That's your career in cool. Hollywood. That, yeah. That's that's what we need to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the Reagan thing that he said? We need something to unite us, and it's yeah. the alien invasion or whatever. But that's a big yeah. conspiracy as well. That they're going to fake an alien invasion for like a one world. Well, that's order. kind of what it sounded like. Yeah. What was? Yeah, that the, was the that was the Stalin concept, right? And then, what I write about in the Area Fifty One book is that the U.S. Defense Department then said, "Well, then we need our own program. If they're going to do that, we're going to do that." And that's where you get into the sort of that takes dual use into like a whole other sort of like myth of narcissus where someone's staring in a pond and they fall in and into the pond and die, you know, because they become so obsessed with what am I seeing? I yeah. like your theory though. It's like team yeah. human versus yeah. team United States versus right. Russia. Right. And, and yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's close to it. But where my comic brain goes when you talk about Stalin and a faked alien is like, when they're in Moscow, they're looking for who can be the alien. And it's like, hey, man, you're kind of ugly. You kind of look like it. And he's like, I don't want to go in the ship, you know? And he's like, well, you got to take one for the team. The other question is, when I'm out there in the world and people talk about the government, okay. my initial knee-jerk reaction is always like, oh, I don't trust the government, you know, blah, blah, blah. But when I hear you talk about the government, I'm like, okay, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I want to do that. That sounds you awesome. Be in the government. Do they know how obviously dark it is, but also how cool what they are doing is on a daily basis? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there's a lot of ego involved, right? And a lot of times why ego is I think, and maybe this is just an outsider looking in, it has to do with like perks and power, right? Like sometimes I would be talking to like CIA operators and it would be like, oh, gotta go, the helicopter's here. You know mm. what I mean? Right. Like, oh, and if you're the sec def, you're just, you just hop on your jet at Andrews and you, you know, like there are, you have all kinds of things at your disposal all the time. Always. And then the strange thing is you leave government and you don't. So they right? don't want to leave. You can't because, more so. Yeah. What do you and mean all, you can't? Well, no, you, you don't have the same you don't have the same perks and power, but then we can oh. get into the whole thing of generals joining defense contractors. Oh, is, that yeah. is a whole other element of the military industrial complex. But um I mean, I think that there are also a portion of people that really are patriotic, you know? And I hate that the word patriotic has become bastardized, right? I was wearing a flag pin once and someone said to me, oh, you're a Republican. It was like, 
It's the American flag. <laughs> that that right? is weird, isn't it? I know. You can't even wave a flag. Like, or what? Do you know how great it is to live in America? Like, yeah. oh my God, our sidewalk, you know, never mind that we have sidewalks, right? I mean, but I do believe that, you know, I was at the funeral um, or the memorial service at, at, a, at a military facility recently for my, one of my, like, like a, a, men, a source of mine, Billy Waugh the longest serving CIA paramilitary operator. Again, served for Eisenhower and all the way through till he was 87 years old, Obama, right? Whoa. And um, I was at this, you know, facility for his memorial service and the the commander of, uh, of the Joint Special Operations Command spoke, like a serious dude, right? A general. And um, he said... Billy rode for the brand, you know? And it's such a great way of saying, like, he really was, he really was committed to the red, white, and blue, the brand of the red, white, and blue, you know? And you might not have liked everything he did or agreed with everything he did, um, but man, was he dedicated to to the United States of America. And I'll, I'll tell you, like, a, a really quick story that just is coming to mind because... I went, I traveled with Billy to Hanoi. Um, he had been in charge of assassinating the general of the Vietnam War, General Jop. And I write about this in Surprise Kill Vanish. It was an insane mission and it failed. But Billy was supposed to kill him. And we went back to, and he was worked in a unit called Mac Vsog, which is like the warriors of the warriors, right? Um, and so we went back to Hanoi to meet the colonel that was assigned to kill him, that was assigned to kill Billy, Whoa. right? And we sat there in General Jop's house in Hanoi. I mean, it was just this, inc I write about it in the book. Yeah. But what was incredible was on the, when we when we flew home, um, we were in the, the cab going back to my house and Billy opened up his suitcase to give me a gift that he had brought with him to Vietnam and carried around our entire trip and it was a rolled up American flag and I still have it in my office and the reason he brought it was because bringing a flag to Vietnam was illegal for <laughs> decades really? having a, a, you know, having an a American, flag. American flag was illegal because we were such at right yeah. and he it was his kind of like middle finger yeah. to all his friends that died there he you know he fought in the Vietnam War he has like seven you know, bullets in his leg oh because of it, right? Um, but it was really interesting that it, he brought the flag. It was like such an artifact, and I, I have that flag, and I keep that flag. And on flag day, it's just as important as it is any, any other day because it's like, you know, he rode for the brand. It meant something to him. He believed in that old idea of, you know, America, you know, so, or America the brave, right? And that is... So when I, I, I'm interested when I hear you say, you know, the government, because there is this perception of like the government, but don't forget the government is, is, is a vast system and there are lots of elements in it. And there are people who are really dedicated and there are people, you know, who have other intentions. Well, well, thank you, Annie, for thank coming by. Much. Yeah, thank you very I much. I really enjoyed your book. When's it coming out? March 26th. March 26th. Where can everyone get it? Obviously. Bookstores everywhere. everywhere. Bookstores everywhere. everywhere. And I read the audio. Oh, you do? You're doing it right now? I've done the audio book, yeah. Ooh. Oh, my God. Get the audio book. <laughs> Boom. Boom. <laughs> yeah, we'll literally. come back and talk about it with you when you I guys have read. We can debate the, the ticking time clock. I can't wait. Thank you very Thank much. you guys so Thank much. You very much. Keep up it. the great work. We'll do it. We'll You're try. the generation. The I last so. one? Hopefully yeah, not. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Cole's going to save the world with uh, yeah, I don't with think I am. You're going to save theory. the world with a Hollywood alien script. I don't think I am. I am going to. I don't know if I need to start spreading that somehow. I don't know how I do that, but we're going to have to design the aliens, make them scary looking. That's critical. And you give them all mushrooms during the meeting. Yeah. I got my work cut out for me. That's for sure. Good luck. One man right <laughs> through. All right. Thank you again. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. Thanks so much, much, guys. Perfect. Woo! Perfect.